Sarah serves as the outreach coordinator at First Existentialist Congregation of Atlanta. She is a fairly recent graduate of Candler School of Theology, where she completed concentrations in chaplaincy and justice, peace building, and conflict transformation. Wow. She is also a universe, Unitarian Universalist ministerial aspirant and a resident hospital chaplain at Emory's Midtown Hospital. Sarah seeks to continue to develop her abilities in connecting people to their strengths and providing radical hospitality. God, I just saw the word hostility for a second there. Hospitality. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Sarah Drew. Yes, thankfully not radical hostility. That would be a, a different situation here. <laughs> just get situated here. All right. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I arrived at this topic. One of the things, as Jan said, I'm a hospital chaplain alongside the work I do here. And one of the things I've started to think about a lot as I work with people in the hospital is that most people seem to be better off when they're able to recognize the bigger picture, even just a little bit. What I mean is when someone is with a loved one who is dying in the hospital, it makes sense that they're sad, devastated even. Some people are entirely devastated, and it makes sense, like I said, reasonable. But if I see them as entirely devastated, I worry that they have waded out into the depths of grief, and I worry that they won't be able to find the shore again. If I can get them to tell me about their loved one, their relationship, a story about their time together, something they love about this person, then I can get them to recognize even just a little bit that this deep grief exists as a result of love. I feel like it gives them that little life raft that they need out in those deep expanses of grief. And it can happen the other way, too, when someone is consumed with love in that hospital room and takes on the perspective of the dying person who is ready to be at peace. I worry that they're doing themselves a disservice then, too, by not attending to their own grief at all, maybe waiting to be home to feel their own feelings. It seems to me that recognizing that wider perspective, even just a little, being able to hold the grief and the love, maybe one much larger than the other, but being able to hold both serves them well. I often feel like it's my job in that situation to name those pieces of that complicated puzzle of emotions, to bring them forward and affirm them. I tell you all that just to explain that I chose our topic this morning because as Jan and Marsha and many of you in your joys and sorrows mentioned, things are hard, rough, unjust, ugly, cruel, isolating, impersonal, cold, sad. Maybe because of the enormity of hearing the news of Sonia Massey murdered in her kitchen, for the crime of calling for help, I can get caught up in the hopelessness of it all. Maybe it's getting older. Jan did a really good job of telling us what it was like to see the life through her godson, right? I can remember that childhood sort of, those new eyes where everything is new and interesting. So maybe it has something to do with getting older, comparing things to how they used to be. Maybe it's our society's turn toward technology or how COVID has changed the way we are. Maybe it's white supremacy, mass shooting, all the bloody war. I could go on. It's easy to allow those things to fill our frame of reference entirely. There are certainly enough of them to push the things that make us happy and fill us with gratitude to the periphery, if not out of the picture altogether. So I've been thinking about that and thinking about that holding of love and grief that I hope people can do in their hospital rooms, with their loved ones, 
And I've been wondering what the little antidote is that I can hold to that heaviness of the sadness of the world. I have always held the nightly news at bay. I don't really want to know. But I do think it's my responsibility to know, which had me thinking about how we might be more intentional about not getting caught up in one perspective over the other. And I came to wonder, awe, enchantment, flow, joy, bliss, even sometimes called enlightenment. And, and then I found this book. It's called Awe. It's written by Dasher Keltner, who spent his whole career researching awe and wrote this book, Awe, the New Science of Everyday Wonder and How It Can Transform Your Life. His definition of awe is the feeling of being in the presence of something vast that transcends your current understanding of the world. He worked on research with a team that took in 2,600 narratives. And from those 2,600 narratives of experiences people had of feeling awe, they created this taxonomy of awe, um, which I myself understand as moments that take your breath away. And you might understand them differently. Take your breath away in a good way, <laughs> not the <laughs> horror way. I think uh, that's because I think of that because that's how I experience it. For instance, most recently when I was walking along a nature trail alongside a pond and I came face to face with a blue heron, right? And starstruck, still, didn't want to breathe, didn't want to move, and we just locked eyes for a minute, you know, that sort of moment. It might feel different for you, but those are the kinds of things you're thinking about where, remember that definition, the feeling of being in the presence of something vast that transcends your current understanding of the world. So you might call to mind a moment you've had. Maybe if you were one of those 2,600 respondents, what you would have offered as your pinnacle moment of awe, so far anyway, and how that feels in your body. Do you have that, like I do, breathlessness or something else? So this taxonomy of awe, uh, Dasher Keltner and his research team called them the eight wonders of life. They are other people's kindness, which they call moral beauty. Can you think of a time when you were struck by seeing one person show kindness to another or a group. The second category is collective effervescence. Very poetic names. Weddings, sports celebrations, graduations, funerals, family reunions, where there's that sort of synergy, excited celebration. I myself, have long thought that I had a thing with bagpipes. Whenever I hear bagpipes, I start to cry. It's like a weird Pavlov's dog situation. Like I don't even have to be worked up and I, bagpipes start playing and I start crying. And I actually, it happened to me so much that I Googled it years ago and it's a thing that happens to people. And after I read this, I might be, I thought maybe it's the collective effervescence. Maybe it's that, situation where I most hear bagpipes at a graduation. For a long time, I worked at a college, and they would regularly have bagpipes. That's why I started to think, something's going on here. Uh, but now, after reading this, I thought maybe it's the collective effervescence. All these people so proud of their young children, right? Like that time in life where they're so young, but they're so accomplished, and they're you know breaking out. This is sort of like social... Um, oneness, and then the bagpipes just put me over the edge. That's what I'm thinking. The third one, I think, is really, um, at least for the people that I know, probably top of the list, nature. That's what my blue hair on was, right? Just being struck by nature. And so you might call to mind a time when you were struck by nature. I think Neil deGrasse Tyson falls in this category, right? And even the Olympics, you think seeing those physical feats of what people can manage to do. 
That's all being struck by nature. Music, no surprise to anyone here in this audience. Can you think of a time when you were struck by music? I remember um, sitting at a friend's father's funeral in this tiny little church in northeastern Pennsylvania, and this woman, I don't even know her name, came out and sung the most beautifully heartbreaking uh, version of Ave Maria that I've ever heard, and I just couldn't catch my breath, right? So you might, does it? Interesting. So you might think of other musical times you've had that have struck you. Visual design. Visual design. So this does include paintings, art. It also includes um, like feats of design, like dams on rivers and um, machines in buildings. I have had the experience of standing um, on the edge of a harbor with a huge ship towering above me and been sort of struck by that, awestruck by that. Skyscrapers, I think, can do this. Um, there was an account in the book about someone just being blown away that the machine that they were looking at, too technical for me to describe, but that the machine they were looking at could actually produce it could work the way that it was working, that it could actually, it gave, came, made me think of Willy Wonka, right? Where it's like this, and then like this most delicious piece of candy pops out, you know, like that, like that's pretty awesome. Uh, the next one is spiritual and religious experiences. Times when people felt like God was talking to them that they understood something about life and death that um, they hadn't known before, sort of a greater truth that they experienced in the world. And ask yourself if you've had any moments like that. Number seven is life and death. Stories about babies being born, loved ones dying. And again, not just a baby being born or someone dying, but having that evoke this relationship you have with the grander scheme of things, some, some window into an understanding that you didn't have before that moment. And the last one is epiphany, which is elusive, I think. Has anyone in the audience had an epiphany before? A few of you, okay. So we have some epiphany gurus we can talk to later. Um, yeah, just a realization, a essential truth that became very clear to you and stopped you in your tracks. So those are the eight different categories. Now, it doesn't really matter, right? Like, I'm not saying, you know, that we have to classify our moments of awe in order to make them real, but... Uh, when we get to trying to uh, cultivate some more of those moments, that information will be helpful. These re researchers are also clear to say, your moments of awe, and not all those 2,600 have to fall into those eight categories. There, are, we were, there were more, but those eight categories were, by and large, the like avenues of awe that they collected. So those are the um, you know, primary opportunities. They also say, this was so interesting to me, they also know what awe is not. So no one mentioned their laptop. No one mentioned Facebook. No one mentioned their Apple Watch or smartphone. No one mentioned a consumer purchase, new Nikes, a Tesla, a Gucci bag, or a Mont Blanc pen. Awe they say, is beyond materialism, money acquisition, and status signaling. The author recognizes this as a difference between the profane and the sacred. After hearing that list, those eight things, we might be thinking about times in our lives. Maybe one, just a few times in a lifetime kind of moments in which we sort of stumble upon awe. 
I, I have never planned for a moment of awe. I almost want to say that I feel like I couldn't plan for it, right? It just sort of catches you by surprise. That's part of it, I think, is that we weren't, you know, um, recognizing every single piece of our opportunity, and it sort of culminated in this thing. So when I start to talk about what we can do, I do recognize that it's not part of the, part of the crux of it is that it cannot be manufactured. If we could manufacture it, we, of course, we would, right? And there are lots of ways in which we try as a society. But that's not exactly the same. These moments have to be authentic. They have to be individual. They have to strike us as important in this way that we cannot control. That's the whole point, right? So if we try to access this emotion... We try to create those little lifeboats for ourselves in this dark sadness that we sometimes get drawn to, caught up in, overwhelmed with. We're going to use these eight areas to inform us. Again, we can't, probably, we can't. If you figure it out, let me know. (laughs) But I think we probably can't cultivate those big, huge experiences. What I do think we can do and what the research shows we can do is open ourselves, and this is a little bit of semantics here. Um, I'm making distinctions that match the research in the words that I'm using, but it matters less what we call them and more that we allow for them. Basically, the research calls an openness Uh, curiosity, a sort of way of being that preferences questioning and embracing mystery, that sort of way of being in the world is wonder in terms of research. And the more we can access that wonder, the more opportunities we will have for awe. Again, that's technical. Um, We really more just want to recognize the feelings when we have them and also have lots of opportunities for them to show themselves to us, right? There are some physical indicators of uh, experiencing this awe or wonder, and they are tears, right? That was my clue in the bagpipe situation, right? Just like these automatic tears that didn't really have a founding, but I think they probably could have a founding, and they would still count as a signal that something more was happening. Chills is another thing they found in the research as having that. So that's sort of an indicator that your body is recognizing something that your mind might not, or maybe it's in conjunction. Um, The research shows that chills most often happen when we are recognizing a social shift happening in our space. Um, So if you think about those um, group celebrations, right, if you were to experience chills in that situation, maybe when you hear your son give his wedding vows, or you hear this vow exchange sing songs back and forth, right? Um, Chills are an indicator. And the other one, uh, I'll just tell you what it is instead of my thoughts about it, but is when you think to yourself or feel to yourself, Whoa, that's the third one. So that one's kind of like, for me, I'm like, but do I manufacture that or does it just happen? Anyway, that's not neither here nor there. When you think to yourself, whoa, like I need, this is something here. That's the, the other uh, physical indicator. And so if we think, I was actually thinking that of those eight categories, there's a lot of them that we're doing here right? We're gathering together. We're playing music. We're sharing those joys and sorrows, right? We're, um, we are maybe having epiphanies. We are uh, watching other people's collective kindness. So, um, you know, in terms of our society, um, this engaging in this is absolutely cultivating those opportunities. Um, And even better so if we recognize them, right? 
um, the idea is that the more of those opportunities you engage in, the more opportunities you have for wonder. So, other people's kindness. How can we up our opportunities to engage in recognizing other people's kindness? Does anybody have an idea? Go ahead. <laughs> I thought you were raising your hand to tell me. Uh, yeah, I think these are my ideas, not what the research says. Um, I think that being around people, first of all, is helpful. I think that being authentic around people is helpful because then they're authentic around you. Being vulnerable with people allows people to be vulnerable with you and also just looking for them, right? It's sort of like gratitude, right? If I'm recognizing the ways in which the world offers me those opportunities of care, then I'm also more open to noticing people pulling their feet when I walk by, people holding doors, people... Um, this is a memory from a long time ago for me, but I once saw a man get hit by a car, not badly, but he was sort of like bumped to the side of the road and he was holding his head. And I saw somebody run across the street while taking his shirt off and hold it to his head. So that was just a, that I couldn't have planned for that, but just recognizing that that man had the foresight to care for this other man in that way in a split second, right? being open to notice those things. The collective effervescence one seems easier to come by, right? We can come here every Sunday, and I hope that you do. Uh, we can do other things in groups, celebrations, noticing that we're all here in this sort of collective way. Um, nature, of course. How do we get more opportunities with nature? We take more opportunities with nature, right? Um, and I, I was thinking, actually, Rick, when you were talking about uh, the Olympics, I remembered that I have a colleague who loves the Olympics, who just is so excited. She, like, took off of work. Like, she's so excited that she gets to engage in these um, Summer Olympics. So, you know, four years ago, that was COVID Olympics, and so it's been a long time since she's really been able to, like, see it. And she was telling somebody this. She told me this story. She was telling somebody how she was so excited, and they said, I can't believe that you really like the Olympics that much. It's so frivolous. Which, like, oh, was like a little knife in her heart, right? Like, we have a tendency, I think, as a society to, to think things are frivolous that maybe are not, right? Um, or at least are not for everyone. And so I think part of it is recognizing, oh, nature can offer me this reciprocal relationship, and I, A, can engage in it, and B, notice it, and C, tell other people about it, right, and make it part of my life. Music, of course, is to listen to music. I was even thinking about how when I drive in my car, I'm a scanner, you know what I mean? I put this scan thing on, and it plays like a minute of every channel, and then I just stop here and stop there, whatever. I could be a lot more intentional about that and actually play music that I like, <laughs> you know, and not like waste uh, the many hours I spend in my car, right? So just even things like that are opportunities. Of course, going to concerts, live music, playing music like our esteemed musicians today. Spiritual and religious experiences. What do we think about that one? Can we cultivate those? How? Kristen, you're shaking your head. Meditation, that's what I was thinking, right? Like being open to the opportunity of it, I think is the main one there, yeah. Um, life and death, I've had, I don't have children. I have had the privilege of being in a delivery room when a baby was born and looking at that baby an hour after she was born was very awe-inspiring, right? Um, and the last one, epiphany. So that one, again, I think it's all about being open to wonder, which I think is a practice, right? It's an intention that we decide and a practice that we keep reminding ourselves. Like maybe if we hear ourselves say, 
oh, that's frivolous, right? Or that kind of thing. Then we ask ourselves, now hold on, is it frivolous? Is it that Gucci bag frivolous? Or am I disregarding something that could actually lend me that lifeboat, right? And so I hope that, you know, we as a community recognize the opportunities that this community is a lifeboat for each of us to sort of guard against the sadness of the world, that we can hold both of those things. And I hope that this community and this experience helps us find more of those out in the world. Yeah? And I usually like to end, I'm just going to, for two more minutes, a little meditation to sort of get us each in our own space. So if you want to get comfortable, maybe drop your left ear towards your left shoulder, your right ear towards your right shoulder, whatever it is, roll your head around, shake out your jaw, maybe your hands, roll your shoulders, whatever it is that helps you. You can close your eyes or find a downward gaze. Notice your breath. I'm sort of combining this research with my own compassion-based research in which the first step is connecting to a nurturing moment. And I wonder if I've been talking today, you've been thinking about times when you've been filled with awe. You could call one of those forward. Imagining yourself in that situation and going through your senses. What do you see there? What do you hear there? Do you feel those chills? Did you cry? Is your heart full? Do you feel light? And just bask in that feeling for a moment. Feel that. Let it fill your heart and mind. Let it work its way out to the tips of your fingers, the tips of your toes. Take your next few breaths and inhale to feed, to nourish that feeling. And exhale anything out that is not serving your connection to that awe, that wonder, that enchantment. Take one more deep breath in. It's like taking a photograph, a feeling photograph of how you feel right now so that you can access it when you might be thinking, oh, this is hard. You can pull it out of your pocket and bring yourself back to this moment which connects you to that moment of awe that you had. And when you're ready, you can lift your eyes, lift your gaze, come back to the room. Thank you so much for letting me talk today. Really appreciate you all and hope that you have lots of moments of wonder as we move forward this morning.